Welcome back uh, to lecture 2.2. Um, now that we learned about steerable kernels or functions that we can rotate simply by manipulating the weights uh, relative to the basis in which they are expanded, uh, let's have a look at what it means to do uh, to build group convolutional net neural networks with uh, steerable kernels. Um, so let's revisit the regular group convolution. So regular group convolution, the intuition that we had behind it was just doing template matching of a kernel k which is transformed by the action of the group. Uh, in many examples we used with the, rotor with the 2D rotor translation group, tr translations in R2 and rotations in uh, SO2. And okay, and then we, so we transform the kernel and take inner products and that's, that looks like this, right? This is the action, the inverse action of G applied to the domain of these kernels, so that shift it around and then we take the inner product and that gives us some number about uh, that tells us something how well the match is with the kernel with the underlying signal and we do this for all uh, elements in the group and that generates this 3D volume which is essentially a volume on uh, SE2 a lifted uh, feature map. Now um, we limit ourselves mainly in, in these lectures on uh, affine groups which split into a translation and a subgroup transformation part um, which is convenient because then we can decide to first, uh, let's say, uh, transform, uh, let's say, first rotate the, the domain and then do the shifting uh, afterwards. And we do that because in many libraries we have convenient implementations for the conf2d or conf3d uh, operator. So that's essentially uh, this blue part. Um, so first a transformation of the kernel via the subgroup H, for example, rotation, and then a translation. And we could denote it as such, right? So simply doing a 2D convolution with a kernel that is pre-transformed, uh, pre-rotated by a, an angle uh, theta. Uh, so, so sorry, I'm mixing up this H and theta indices every now and then. H is sort of the general setting and theta is kind of specific for the 2D rotations. But I think that that's clear, right? Okay, so this is then uh, what it looked like, right? So we have a kernel Okay, I convolve it with the image and whenever this pattern matches uh, with the signal, I get a high response. So a white uh, gray value in this case and black means uh, negative. Uh, so this has a kind of exact opposite signature of, of this kernel. Um, okay, so that's what we do with this template matching. Uh, we rotate the kernel and then we convolve it over the image. And uh, then we, gener we create a stack of responses for all subgroup transformation H we, we remember, we memorize what the response was. So we, uh, well, keep in memory the stack of uh, responses. And I think this idea of uh, template matching, where we have a high response when the kernel aligns, is better visualized when we apply a value, right? When, when we only uh, keep the positive values, whether, whether it was a positive alignment or a positive match of this kernel with the underlying signals. So you see, whenever the, uh, the kernel is aligned with some of the edges, and all the edges have some orientation, then we have a high response. And yeah, so we, we do this and uh, generate this three-dimensional uh, volume or feature map on position rotation space on SE2. Okay, and so now then what happens in this lifting convolution from a 2D image to uh, a, an image on the group or a feature map on the group? What happens if we do this with a steerable convolution kernel, right? We, we denote this as follows. So we have a kernel K, which is parameterized by a bunch of weights and it is a steerable in the following way, right? So our kernel as a function of x parameterized by w is simply given by a linear combination of these two uh, basis functions. Now, so now I'm focusing only on this two-dimensional uh, vector space or this two-dimensional basis. Now, in the previous video, we learned that a rotation or a transformation of such an H subgroup H steerable uh, kernel is simply obtained by letting the representation act on the weights that parameterize the kernel. So we can keep the, the basis functions uh, the same. So if I insert this in the definition of or lifting a group convolution, this is what's happening, right? So I'm just filling the kernel, which means I'm convolving with this transformed uh, kernel uh, uh, and the underlying signal uh, f. Okay, and this, this correlation has this integral over x prime, but this part doesn't um, depend on x prime at all, right? So I can, and, it, and it's linear, so I can keep it outside of the integral. So this tells me if I want to evaluate the response in this lifting convolution for a particular rotation h, I first convolve with the basis functions, and then I can 
uh, do the steering afterwards. So that's happening here, right? So let's just store the res result of convolving with our basis function in this f hat uh, superscript y. And if I then want to know what was the response for a particular orientation h, I uh, simply evaluate this expansion of the relative to the rotated uh, weights. And this is really nice, right? So it basically means in order to reconstruct any possible rotation, I only need to store these two responses uh, in memory and I do not need to discretize the, the, the group for every possible uh, group element uh, because I can evaluate this afterwards. So this is much more mem memory friendly and you can do a lot of interesting uh, stuff with that. And that's uh, actually done. So, so this idea of steerable convolution was uh, mainly introduced by uh, Freeman et al. Uh, and so please check out this particular paper from the 19, early 1990s uh, even where they um, also built on this idea and introduced this idea that uh, this f hat of y basically encodes for all these orientation uh, or directional information in the data, let's say. Uh, so you can store this as a vector field or a tensor field. And then if we're interested in particular uh, properties, such how anisotropic is the data at a certain location, I can derive that from these uh, f hat superscript y's. Uh, you can use it to design uh, vessel filters where you only want to, for example, detect edges at the maximum orientation to reduce the noise uh, in your signal. So all these kind of things are explored in this uh, paper by, by Freeman et al. So this paper, the, de the design and use of steerable filter, uh, yeah, that's where the terminology of steerable uh, convolutional neural networks uh, essentially comes from. Okay, so moving back to what we were talking about, these uh, group convolutions we just derived, that these lifting group convolutions evaluated at a point x under a particular rotation uh, theta is simply uh, obtained by taking the inner product of our function f uh, convolved with these uh, basis functions y, so that's stored in this uh, f hat superscript y, and take the inner product with our transformed weights uh, w. And that looks like this, so we first compute these convolutions of basis function one, basis function two, and that creates a stack of basis functions. And obviously we can do this at once with a conf2d or conf3d or conf2d operator, which all of the nice uh, GPU-based libraries uh, uh, have. And the idea then is it's much more, oftentimes it's much more memory efficient to just store these uh, basis functions in memory instead of uh, indexing for all possible uh, rotations. Because once we have this, we can obtain the directional responses um, in any particular direction theta uh, um, via this uh, uh, scalar product that you see over there. Okay, so this is really nice. There's still one slide thing which is a bit awkward still and that's in order to evaluate the response for a particular theta, I do need to have access to these w's. And so what we're now going to do is we're going to do some rewriting and sort of absorb these w's into these feature maps f such that everything we need is really contained within these feature maps uh, themselves and not being part of the evaluation procedure, uh, let's say. Um, so let's do that. So this is what we have so far. A lifting group convolution can be obtained uh, in this way. First computing uh, the convolutions with the basis functions and then do this uh, scalar product. Um, now the trick that I'm using here um, is that a scalar product, so uh, a row vector multiplication, could also be evaluated by taking um, well the vector row multiplication. So this generates a matrix upon uh, which has along the diagonal the, the elements that we want to have, right? So uh, b i times i i <laughs> along the diagonal, and the trace is really summing over diagonal, right? So you see that this uh, scalar product could also be written in trace form. And the reason I'm doing that is because then we have these, uh, these filter responses and the weights together, uh, which we can evaluate uh, as, as, as a product and, and keep in memory uh, as such. Another thing that I uh, use over here is that uh, in this particular case, actually in all cases of the represent representation of the compact groups that we use in, in uh, these lecture notes or in these lectures, we have this property that the conjugate transpose of our representation equals the inverse uh, uh, representation. So, okay, so what we did, we had this particular form, which we derived before, and we now write it in this form, where we have a nicely the filter response and the weights uh, together, and the representation here on the right-hand side. And now let's just define this f hat, so I omit the superscript y, as such, right? It's this uh, vector vector uh, tensor product, which 
jointly encodes for all possible information of the features um, um, yeah, that, that are described by the filters. So it has both the basis uh, function response in them as well as the filter uh, weights. And so in general, this describes a tensor field, right? For every X, I have this, this, this tensor product uh, over here. But since uh, we're only interested in the trace, we can, um, well, we can filter out the stuff that we need and vectorize it. So you should really think of this as a vector field of, of factors that describe oriented uh, feature information. And the nice thing about this form is actually that it corresponds to an inverse Fourier transform, as we will see in, in the upcoming lectures. And I think this is a really important intuition to have, that these vector fields really encode uh, a field of Fourier coefficients, from which if we take the inverse Fourier transform, we create a signal on the subgroup H. And I'm going to illustrate that uh, in the next slide. But it's worth noting here that these rows represent uh, your Fourier functions, and um, these f hats represent the corresponding uh, Fourier coefficients. And this trace then sums over this product of the coefficients with the basis function, right? So that's like an inverse Fourier transform. So what do we have so far? So we had in the regular group convolution setting, we uh, convolved our image with a stack of rotated filters and that generate the, a function on the group uh, SE2, in this case, uh, uh, directly. Um, what we have with the steerable uh, method, we could convolve with the basis functions and then absorb the weights in it. And that creates these vector fields. And these vector fields encode for the directional responses at all these locations. And if we do a pointwise inverse Fourier transform, we recover the regular group convolution uh, setting. And maybe the intuition is a bit like this, right? At each position X, I store the response of the filter for every possible uh, rotation. And in well, the regular case, I'm really going to sample H or the rotation group with, with a bunch of rotations, let's say over 90 degree angles or 45 degree angles or finer grids. And if I, if I were to do this uh, at an infinitesimal grid, I would have a lot. I would inf have infinitely many of these rotations and I can never fit that in memory, right? And so that the idea about this steerable group convolutions is that I only uh, store the Fourier coefficients, which are defined relative to this Fourier basis or the steerable basis from which I can, in principle, reconstruct uh, these signals. And in this particular example, I only use uh, frequency one uh, basis functions. But if I were to add more and more higher frequencies, then I can also detect uh, more and more interesting signals uh, along this, this rotation axis. So I can pick up more interesting, uh, well, yeah, local orientation uh, patterns. Um, we saw that before, right? That if we only have a low uh, frequency uh, band limit, let's say, then we can only represent simple convolution kernels. And if we add more and more higher frequencies, we can start picking up very interesting patterns. And that also means that our ori orientation sensitivity also increases with more and more uh, frequencies uh, that we add. And that's illustrated in this uh, uh, top figure. Okay, so on the one hand side, we have these regular group convolutions, which extend or expand the domain of these feature maps. So I still have regular feature maps, which assign for every position and subgroup transformation or rotation some feature value. And that's illustrated like here. So I have a higher dimensional uh, feature map. And in contrast to that, we have the steerable group convolutions, which you can think of expanding the co-domain of the feature maps, uh, because the still the domain is RD, so we're still talking about uh, two-dimensional uh, feature maps. It's just that their codomain are not just scalar values that encode for the presence of a feature, but it's like directional um, feature values. Uh, and from these directional feature values here, uh, visualized as arrows, so feature values that contain some directional information, I can recover the full signal on this subgroup H group via an inverse uh, Fourier transform. And the main and really important difference between these two approaches is that in the regular group convolution approach, I really have to discretize my subgroup H and really store for every possible subgroup transformation H what the response was. Uh, whereas in the steerable method, I only need to uh, well, convolve with some basis functions. And that tells me for every possible rotation, so really for the continuous group of uh, rotations, let's say, I have all the information uh, that is uh, that can be present that is there in the vector. So the steerable group convolution do not need a discretization of the subgroup and therefore really respect the continuous nature which these subgroup H uh, can have. Uh, 
Um, so then, so what we really would like to have then is really uh, an equivalent of the regular group convolution, but then for the steerable group convolution case, such that we can transform these steerable feature maps without ever having to sample the subgroup H. And this is what we're going to figure out in the upcoming lectures, um, how to do this.